Folks, like we said, today we're talking about some interesting research from Harvard University um, that's going to help rev revolutionize holograms um, and kind of this mixed reality tech space that we're talking about. Um, when I hear holograms, the first thing I think of is like how in Star Wars, whenever they had a video message or like a video oh, yeah. call with someone, they're able to talk to the 3D version of that person, like it, sitting as like a pocket sized version of them on their desk. Um, I think that's like a really interesting reality. Um, if we were ever able to achieve it and we would all look backward at like, especially the Star Wars from the 70s and be like, wow, George Lucas, like, how did you understand this future? But technology today has not really gotten us to a point where that's a reality that any of us can trust, right? can trust right researchers have worked for a long time to try and make 3d holograms that can be viewed from any angle and it feels similar to viewing a real object honestly the uh the end result of all this work has been a little bit underwhelming i don't know if you've ever seen one of these things if not you should probably go check it out on youtube like you can tell even in the 2d version of trying to understand the 3d object that it's a little bit clunky right yeah i mean I feel like on the consumer side, we've seen a bunch of different products that came out. Um, you see on, I think very commonly on like mid to higher level cars right now, you get the heads up display that's a hologram displayed to you and it's okay. But like you're saying, that should be a 2D image. And even that is kind of underwhelming at times to look at. So then you think about the 3D version of it when you're supposed to use, like let's say augmented reality. I know Google was doing the Google Glasses for a while. I think Snap does the same thing with their, what's it called? Snap something. I don't know. Spectacles. Spectacles. That's what it is. And it's, it's, it all just kind of falls short of this idea that we were promised. And like, you're talking about Star Wars. Dude, Iron Man 1, which is probably one of the main reasons subconsciously I became an engineer. When he's doing the CAD on like the Mark 1 and he yes. like pulls it up and he's pull, I'm like, oh my God. Yes. That's what I want to do with my life. Where is it? Huh? Where is Iron Man one that we were promised in two thousand nine? But yeah, I like, mean, where, where's this? Where's this future we can live in where you can create like a virtual projection of an object and it feels like you know it looks close enough to being real that your brain believes that it's a real three D object that you're able to interact with. That's a future that I think a lot of research has been working towards, um, but generally, like we said, there's still a depth perception issue. Um, when you're interacting with these products, these VR, AR, XR products, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, um, but also to this holography technology field in general has a problem with depth perception, especially if you're trying to view things from different angles. So maybe they're able to replicate the 3D effect from a very specific angle. But if you move to a different angle or you know adjust your viewing angle, it doesn't look 3D anymore. Or um, if you're looking at it from super far away, it doesn't look super detailed. Or if you're using something like your Snapchat spectacles, I'm not sure if there's a specific challenge with those. I, I didn't use that product specifically. I haven't but, either. I've just heard. Um, I, I've heard that like you maybe are able to replicate the 3D effect in the middle of the object that you're looking at. But as you start to look towards the edges, it looks kind of foggy and blurry. Um, all that to say, it's not visually, truly emulating the 3D experience. It's still very easy to tell that what the, what you're looking at isn't, a real object it's a virtual object and they're not doing a great job at portraying it yeah and like the underlying problem as explained in this article kind of makes sense right like even if you don't understand optics well enough like just think about semi-transparent sheets that are supposed to be put together in front of your eyes to resemble a ball right like you would have a very small circle slightly bigger slightly bigger and then the other side of it, slightly smaller, slightly smaller. And then when you kind of look at it, it looks like a sphere. Generally speaking, that last one or two spheres, they're going to get more and more blurred because you have limited access of visibility to them. And that's kind of what happens when they render this stuff to you as a hologram, right? You get layers projected onto you as coplanar to your eyes. And so when you try to change the angle that you're looking at, those last few layers start looking more and more blurry, which messes up your depth 
reception. Yep. I think one of the like challenging things about holograms in general too, and especially like trying to interact with them, um, the way that you talked about Tony Stark doing it in yeah. Iron Man, um, is also the fact that the way that we've been projecting light largely um, has trouble when an obstacle gets in the way as yep. well. Right. Intense. So it's like, if I want to interact with this th- object in 3d virtual object in 3d space, um, my hand will start to block the light and then I won't be able to see the rest of the projection, see the rest of the holographic image. Um, so that's another pain point again, that just reduces the immersiveness, reduces the, you know, reality in the mixed reality or in the augmented reality right so it um we can talk a little bit about this later but i think specifically in the vr ar xr space that's really buzzy right now especially following the release of apple's vision pro perfect timing um, for this podcast episode by the way exactly right (laughs) but i think that something feeling immersive something feeling real and something feeling engaging enough that people want to actually adopt this technology is really really important to the future of it even existing. So right now, the current state that we live in, um, without this research from Harvard, where there isn't really, really good 3D depth perception with holography, um, it's a detriment to these technologies that want to capitalize on it because it doesn't feel real. I'm, I'm going to take a step back here, like out of this whole optics realm, right? When we talk about new technology, it is imperative that whatever you come up with feels as authentic as possible to the end user. Like that's how you assure adoption, right? So when I think about what we've talked about, like 3D printed food before, right? It has the wrong texture, flavor might mm-hmm. not be right. People are not going to want it. Then you had the founder of Impossible who was like, instead of trying to like get people to enjoy veggies and stuff, I was like, I'm going to mimic meat flavor, meat texture, meat like juices coming out of a burger as well as I can. And in doing so, created a very successful company and product to the point that honestly, sometimes I choose an impossible burger over the normal patty served at Burger King or whatever, because I just think they're that good, right? So that's a winning product. And now when you're thinking about augmented reality, at least like my two cents here, by the way, I don't want to see we emojis popping up here and there, right? Like I want to see things that look as real as possible, just like Tony Stark was looking at it, just like in Star Wars when it looked like you were having a meeting and you were rendering rendering those people perfectly. That's what I'm going for. And I feel like a lot of other people are in the same boat. So even though something as small as, oh, it's kind of blurry, like the depth perception isn't right, or as the light is projecting, it kind of bends. So it takes me out of my immersion, might not seem like a big deal, it's those little details that can make or break a product, right? Yeah, and, and so let's let's talk about how this team from Harvard is using their their new technology breakthrough kind of to try and combat these challenges, right? So it's not um, it's not that they're completely reinventing the three D hologram method. What they've actually their secret sauce here, what they've actually done differently, is use a unique type of light beam that is being used to generate this 3D hologram. So it's called a Bessel beam. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, This special type of beam is um, kind of like throwing a stone into a pond and then ripples in the water spread out in circles around that, concentric circles around that. So a Bessel beam is just like that, but with light instead of water. So when you use a series of Bessel beams together, right, a a bunch of them together to create this holographic image, two very special things happen. The first part is the core, the center of the beam, stays the same strength no matter how far that beam travels. So unlike, uh, I think of something like a flashlight where you point it up into the night sky and the light from that flashlight gets dimmer the further that it shines, the Bessel beam, because of this like concentric circle um, nature of it, the center, the core of that stays just as bright no matter how far the light is traveling. The second part, is that because of these ripples, the concentric circles of light emanating around that core, um, if something gets in the way of the light beams, it can heal itself. So that means um, even if an object is blocking part of the beam, like you're sticking your hand inside the hologram, um, once the light has passed past that object, it like fills back in the missing part. So it's like you had a magic flashlight that could shine around corners. So Bessel beams start to attack these pain points that we're experiencing with 3D holograms where it's like, 
you know, maybe depending on the angle you're looking at, the intensity of the light isn't correct, or whether it's at the middle or at the edge of the image, the intensity of the light isn't correct to where it renders the image properly, where it feels real, feels immersive that it's 3D. And then also when you try and interact with it, when you try to put your hand in it and it casts a shadow instead of um, the rest of the object appearing the way it was before, um, that reduces from the immersiveness. Um, Bessel beams seem to be like the silver bullet to help attack both of these pain points. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head here, right? There's two problems that we talked about that exist. These Bessel beams address all of them. And I had kind of talked about how the rendering was happening with the traditional approach. You know, you have coplanar layer after layer after layer that distorts the last layer but now with these bessel beams it actually is rendered perpendicularly to your eyes right so it gets rid of that problem as a whole and then lastly you have what you talked about which is if you're interacting with your hand um, it doesn't destroy the immersion because the light beam recovers but a little nuance to that um, so if you were shining a light and you put your hand in right the light wouldn't completely stop. It kind of bent and then stopped. So it looked like there was like yeah. still like a shimmer on your hand, which was weird. Like that object isn't real. But these Bessel beams, they don't have that. It's, it's, I forgot the terminology they used, but it's more clear cut. Not only does it recover, but in terms of disruption, um, it handles it much, much more uh, delicately. And, and I will say, optic stuff Way. in general... And this one specifically, way over my head. Um, this is me, like, after hours of research trying to understand exactly what a Bessel beam does and how it works, I wasn't able to completely get there. Um, but what I was able to get is those two key takeaways. And I think that's all that we really need to take away from this is, like, these Bessel beams are really interesting because they're able to maintain intensity no matter how far the light travels. And, you know, if, if an object gets in the way, instead of light bending around it, it's able to, like, kind of magically heal itself um yeah both absolutely. of those are really and now really i think it's compelling. worth noting of like the value of this we you touched on this but apple vision pro just announced right like what does how does this going to translate into these products that we care about i mean i care about personally i think it's amazing i'm super excited for it but what does it mean for us right and apple displayed like if you're a creative person, now you can leverage this new product that they've made with augmented reality to do your design in 3D space. We've talked about this in the past, I think one of our earlier episodes where a doctor was using a augmented reality goggle to shape the implant that they were going to use on a patient, right? So in those cases, accuracy really matters and you don't want any sort of distortion. This kind of technology can make sure that the augmented reality solutions or even virtual reality solutions or mixed reality solutions that we get are as precise as possible, especially for applications where that's a necessity. Well, and I, I will just say there, there's a graveyard of technology solutions that have tried to enter the AR, VR, XR space, um, but have flopped. Google Glass from Google, Virtual Boy from Nintendo, Snapchat Spectacles, um, Magic Leap 1, Jaunt VR, that's just a handful of the couple that, you know, didn't make it to market like they hoped to or did a did a launch and, you know, didn't garner the user adoption that they hoped to. Yeah. Um, and then I think even further, th there are devices that work really, really well, like the Oculus for the virtual reality experience. And even that hasn't been adopted quite as well um, as, let's say, Zuckerberg might have hoped, right, <laughs> yeah. when he's talking about making a metaverse. <laughs> Um, that being said, right, my personal take here, my opinion, right, I think the core of all these issues is the fact that, you know, maybe these, um, devices don't look great on your head, or maybe they're a little bit uncomfortable, or maybe it's like weird to look like you're wearing ski goggles in public. I think those are like all minor, um, inefficiencies, minor friction points, let's say for the user. Um, but that's not something that can't be overcome. If the technology is solid enough, if it's immersive enough, if it, adds enough value to someone's life um for me to be honest it's because the technology hasn't gotten to a point yet hasn't gotten mature enough yet to where like it feels real when you're in a mixed reality experience you know you still have to suspend a little bit of disbelief um and i think using technology like this tech from harvard and maybe apple's gotten somewhere close to there as well with their holography is like once you create an experience that's truly immersive 
users will start to flock to it be- because of the experience, because it feels real, regardless of the fact that it'll, you know, they might look ridiculous wearing ski goggles, ski goggles everywhere in public. Um, and then because of that, because you've got, you start to get a critical mass of users doing that, it starts to become normal to wear these ski goggles in public. I remember at the beginning when Apple released AirPods, everyone was making a joke about how it looked just like earbuds, but you cut the wires off. That's still ridiculous. No one will ever use them. No one will ever wear those in public. And yet... All it needed was a really strong user experience to get a bunch of early adopters in there. That was enough of a critical mass that everyone saw people wearing AirPods, and you're like, you know what? Maybe I'll jump on board as well. And I did the same thing, right? At first, I was making fun of it, a um, couple of years later, I bought my first pair of AirPods and I would say they've like changed my audio experience life. So um, that's a long rant and I'll get off my soapbox here. But I think this research that this team from Harvard's doing to make sure that holography, you know, feels more real um, could be an overall contribution to the AR, VR trend and other applications in various fields that things like Apple's Vision Pro are also trying to break into, which is like making a virtual technology, a part of our real world as well. It's funny that you brought up an app product when coming up with an example of something that, you know, caused this shift in people's perception of a product. And then Apple Vision Pro is the big thing that we're talking about today. And the example that I was thinking of was the Apple iPhone. Like if you remember the Apple iPhone 4 when it came out, um, it, it was technically the second phone, but it was still pretty new for most people. Um, If you held it the wrong way, you would short the antenna connection, like your calls would drop, right? Which is just like maybe the first thing that you try to get right uh, when it comes to a product that is a phone meant for calling, right? But this product was so well made in terms of its experience, like that's kind of what you were getting at, its ecosystem's experience, that people were like, yeah, no, not a big deal. I love like, look, I can play around with the apps. I got so much music in it. Who cares? Like it'll get better. And it did. Right. But the first version had its flaws. It was clunky. It wasn't good looking, but it really delivered on the user experience. So if the integration of the work that these folks did at Harvard can move the um, move us forward just a little bit to getting closer to that, like real immersion scenario, I think these products can actually become pretty successful. And History has shown Apple has been the trailblazer when it comes to new products. Maybe they'll they'll knock this out of the park. Yeah, I agree. And I would be interested, honestly, if this team from Harvard can get their hands on a Vision Pro and test it out and try it um, and compare it to their own holography, um, see if they, uh, you know, get their unfiltered opinion on how good the <laughs> Apple Vision Pro is before I go drop 3500 bucks on getting it, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, now, before... I was going to say it's probably a good spot to end the episode, but before we do that, um, you should do a recap of everything that we just talked about. I'm with you, man. So I will kind of go all the way back to the beginning. Um, holograms, we've been working on them for a little while. We've seen them in sci-fi movies. Um, the goal is so that you can see 3D holograms from any angle. It's a you know digital virtual rendering of a, of a di- virtual object in the physical world, and it feels and looks real. Um, that reality hasn't always come to fruition. And this team from Harvard developed a new method for creating 3D holograms to try and improve that experience. So they used a special kind of light called a Bessel beam. And it kind of stacks, they stack these beams together um, like slices of cheese, slices of cheese to create like a sandwich of light. Um, And then these light sheets are used to build a 3D projection. When you look at it with your eyes, um, because of this unique Bessel beam that they used, um, it feels more real because the Bessel beam has higher control over intensity as well as like self-healing properties. So the light doesn't bend when it hits an obstacle. Um, all that comes together to make a real, more real looking 3D projection. That's what this team from Harvard has done. Um, they think we can use it to improve virtual and augmented reality. They also plan on using it in biological imaging and optogenetics um, and one thing that I think is interesting, we didn't mention it yet, but Harvard's Office of Technology Department is already protecting this idea with a patent. So they know it's going to be big. They're looking forward to commercializing it and making some money off of it as well. Love to hear. I hope it makes it out and gets into some products, hopefully ones that you and I are going to use in the not so distant future. Yeah. Uh, but on that note, thank you guys so much for listening. And as always, we will catch you in the next one. Peace.